So Zach, I thought um, for Peel Tube, I talk about something kind of glaring and noticeable about my personality, something you may yourself have some thoughts about. And I, I want to link it up to um, a little musical interlude um, called Sit Down, Peel, You're Rocking the Boat which comes from Guys and Dolls and was written by Frank Lesser. <clears throat> I dreamed last night I got on a boat to heaven and by some chance I brought my dice along and there I stood, I hollered, someone fade me but the passengers they knew right from wrong for the people all said, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. The people all said, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. And the devil will drag you under by the sharp lapel of your checkered coat. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, peel, sit down, you're rocking the boat. I sailed away on that little boat to heaven and by some chance found a bottle in my fist. And there I stood nicely passing out the whiskey. But the passengers were bound to resist. For the people all said, beware, you're on a heavenly trip. People all said, beware, beware, you'll scuttle the ship. And the devil will drag you under by the fancy tie around your neck. Sit down, sit down, sit down, peel, sit down, you're rocking the boat. And as I laughed at those passengers to heaven, <laughs> a great big wave came and washed me overboard. And as I sang, I hollered, someone save me. That's the moment I woke up, thank the Lord. And I said to myself, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. I said to myself, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. And the devil will drag you under with a settled soul so heavy you'll never float. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, Peel. Stand up. You're rocking the boat. Well, two things. One, well done. You carried it all the way through. And I hate the situations where someone sings, but then I'm supposed to react and I don't know what to do. Still, it leads me to the essential question. Why won't you shut up? And I wonder, I'm going to ask your opinion about that. Um, because, you know, I've written a memoir, Scientific Life on the Edge. And it's because I'm just going to, uh, uh, Peter McDermott, who's a writer and researcher, is a longtime friend of Maya Salovitz. He commented, and I quote in my um, memoir, Stan's obsessive nature is one of his best qualities. That's a good sentence. Mm -hmm. That refusal to accept the status quo and keep worrying away at the issues that bother him, like a dog with a bone, is exactly what he's done for the last 40 years and why he continues to be relevant when other less interesting commentators have fallen by the wayside. I very much doubt that Gabor Mate feels as though He's being slandered, but I bet she wishes Stanton would just shut up. He's <laughs> hardly the first self-appointed drug expert to find themselves in that position, and I'm sure he won't be the last. I don't know uh, a lot about Peter McDermott's work, but that's a pretty good description of me and how people react to me. And I just want to describe um, three experiences of my life from my memoir. Um, because when you write your memoir, you sort of look at it and say, damn it, why am I like that? So uh, I was in something called the honor program at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, at when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I entered 1963, they had a two-year language requirement unless you took a test and opted out. And I took German high school, but I couldn't do well enough to opt out. So I took French and I was in the honor program French. And after the first year, they took me aside and they said, 
you know, we can't flunk you in the honor program, but we're not going to let you get two years of your French in the honor program. We're going to throw you out to the regular university. It's almost like they were saying, why don't you see how you do in the real world, Stanton? Um, and so I took summer school French. And I have to confess, I was never really very good at French. And I'm going to say something. I, I hope it doesn't um, haunt my career and the career of an unnamed person. They didn't, um, the professor Blumenthal didn't give tests. She just required us to write little brief paragraph long essays every week. And it so happened I had a friend who uh, I knew at Penn. He since became a judge. He's retired now. And I took all of his high school essays and I turned them in. <laughs> and so during class, I tried to keep a very low profile. Well, you had to speak in French in class and it would be pretty obvious what an idiot I was, you know what I mean, in French. So one day, Professor Blumenthal starts discussing Celsius versus Fahrenheit. And, you know, this whole episode made me think about, I don't know, I can't remember when I attended University of Pennsylvania from 63 to 67, I don't remember if there was ever a black student in any of my classes. I don't remember that there was. In the summer school, there was a man from French West Africa and Professor Blumenthal really liked him. And uh, of course he spoke French very well, uh, but not to put him down, he spoke English better than all the rest of us spoke French. And she called on him to explain how to translate centigrade into Fahrenheit. And he went up to the board and he wrote a formula and the formula was wrong. What do you think I did about that, Zach? How do you think I reacted to that? I bet you stayed quiet. No, kidding. I, I don't think you could resist, could you? I waited because I thought, you know, this is the University of Pennsylvania. There's like 50 kids, it was a summer class. And somebody's going to point it out and nobody did. So I finally raised my hand and I said, Professor Blumenthal, can I talk in English? <laughs> and she said, yeah. And I said, well, that formula is wrong. All you have to do is plug in zero centigrade has to end up equal 32 Fahrenheit and 32 Fahrenheit uh, centigrade, 100 centigrade has to end up being 212 Fahrenheit. And that's wrong. I think she was trying to do a good job of, you know, yeah. opening up the class to diversity. Right. Okay. And to give him his proper credit. So she had a really good motive. I mean, why did nobody in the class say anything? I, there are no correct answers to any of these questions. No, no, no. I, I got you. Well, th this is a great microcosm. So I, I understand why you're doing this. Um, why would you say something? Why would you demolish a good motive? You know, things are going the way that they're supposed to be going in terms of that goal. So why interrupt that nice goal and flow of things with, you know, a pesky fact? Why? Why That's would it. I do it? And why, why would, would nobody else in the class do it? I guess nobody else in the class would do it because A, they didn't care. Right. Maybe they weren't even paying attention. Because I'm sitting there, a little boy from Northeast Philly, thinking, this is the University of Pennsylvania. You can't just put something that's wrong up. Right. And say everybody agree. You can't do that. You're there to learn. So where do you go from there? If you start on the basis of an untrue thing, that it's like the emperor's new clothes thing. Maybe 98% of the room knew that it was an untrue thing. Maybe she knew. And, uh, but, but what, that can't be your basis for moving along from there. And, and then we go on to, I mean, maybe I'm overgeneralizing. All those Trumpites can say, well, the election was fake. If you don't have truth, if you can't connect yourself to a true statement, 
you have nothing. You can say anything and you're saying nothing, right. And my career is about doing that. So I ran into the mayor, believe it or not, Bill de Blasio in New York City. And um, his daughter had just gone into rehab. This story is unbelievable. And the mayor used to work out at the Park Slope Y. You, you've been in Park Slope. And I went up to him. You know, you have to watch yourself. He's got all these people. And I said, you know, I read about your daughter going into rehab. You know, that's not the only way to do it. And then, believe it or not, later, I met him across the street at the croissant place. And he said, you seem to know a lot about it. I'll give, give me your email. I'll put you in touch with the person I have who names Gary Belkin. He's the executive deputy commissioner in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And then I got an email from him. And he wanted to meet me because he was dealing with the Thrive program, which is a peer counseling program. And he was getting a lot of uh, incoming flack from disease people. And so the aim is to get people to help people with ongoing emotional and substance problems, which people who listen to know my work, know our discussions in the Life Process Program, know that we're a here and now, let's deal with life kind of approach. So um, he asked me to meet with him and several of his staff and then he called a meeting and then he called it off. And um, he called another meeting and then he called it off. He wanted to meet with his two key people, Dennis Payone and uh, Holly Catania. And we never had that meeting. So I never became a central player um, in the Bill de Blasio mental health program. But I did run into, I already knew Denise Payone. Believe it or not, she was a student in the class I taught at Teachers College. I knew her a long time. And in 2017 in October, um, Andrew Tatarski had a celebration of harm reduction. And um, it was sponsored by um, Drug Policy Alliance, and the International Drug Policy Reform Group. Um, and they called it a celebration, including new, they were touting new solutions for the opioid crisis. And all the leading New York harm reductionists discussed the progress in the field. And then Denise Payone, very thoroughgoing, she presented a graph. And what the graph showed was overdose deaths, New York City, 2000 to 2017. And over the last three years, from 2014 to 2017, they had shot up radically in New York City. Um, so this is the drug crisis in the United States has experienced in New York City. They all showed that. Um, in 2017, set an all-time record at the time for 70,000 drug deaths, related deaths. So Denise gave all of the things that they were doing. They were giving Narc Narcan out to everybody, uh, which is an immediate reversal of overdose. They gave people at this conference that. They developed a rapid response to uh, any overdose or trauma drug situations where the city would immediately go there. They had a major program on cutting prescription painkillers and they emphasize very much medicine assisted treatment. And then she presented a graph showing a rapid uptick in drug deaths over the last couple of years. So can you see how I'm sitting there? I, these are people I know and everybody's celebrating. And I'm saying, well, what are they celebrating? And you just see little old me, the place was packed. And just like in that French class, not one person said, 
But wait a second, drug deaths are increasing. We're missing some both. And so I tentatively raised my hand. I've known Andrew a long, long time. And he never called on me. And all I was going to say is, why are drug deaths rising if we're doing such great things? And why do you think Andrew didn't call on me? He knew what you were up to. I would guess. I was supposed to have Noam Chomsky in my program. He agreed to do it. And um, I haven't heard from him since. We set a date and I asked him if he wanted to do it. But that's neither here nor there. You can think what you want of his politics or his theories or whatever he thinks of the mind. But he does have a nice quote that I'll butcher. And it's something like, um, I've encountered many people who can lead a class who are um, so eloquently. And uh, if you're the kind of person who can do that and lead a room to do the thing that you're saying because you say it so eloquently, you should not do that. <laughs> you should temper the impulse to do it. And for the reasons that you are mentioning, you know, it's like why we elect certain politicians um, because we think that they speak so well, they can, they can capture the things that we've been thinking in a soundbite. That, that, that's not necessary. Having charisma is not necessarily a bad thing, but charisma without being anchored to facts and what's relevant is is a bad thing, and it can be easily misleading. And the best example of that in our lifetime, of course, is Donald Trump has some kind of mesmerizing quality. Yeah, and what he says makes no sense at all. Mm. It's detached from reality, and then we have the COVID crisis, and then we have global warming and um, we have riots in the streets and then he says oh the election went and nobody cares about the truthfulness of those things he's so good at or so trumpian at presenting these things that they just are and i live in a different universe than that and the point that I make, which makes me even more unpopular, is Trump is Trump. And all these people in the places I hang out are all progressives. But it's remarkable the extent to what Chomsky said is true for them, too. Well, right. here's, here's the paradigm. We're all going to buy into it. Nobody's allowed to object. And I just don't know how to do that. I never learned that skill. So let me give one last horrible example. Let me just say first that, do you remember being interviewed by my friend Eric White? He's a young guy that had a podcast. He interviewed you about your book. He said a term that, I, that rang true to me about you. He said that you, you are a very heterodox thinker. In other words, you're not swayed, but you're not, you're very, pretty much progressive, I'd say. And, but you're not swayed by another progressive for the sake of being progressive you want to talk about what's true. And there's a small community of people in you know, maybe every field who want to do that, even if they're wrong about something, that's what they want to do. So anyway. I'm not deterred by what other people's opinions are about me. It doesn't bother me to be the only person in a room saying something. Um, there's a famous experiment, I think we might have discussed this by Solomon Ash, where he did it at the new school, where you get a bunch of people around the table, 12, and 11 of them you pay. And there's one person who wasn't paid, he's the subject. And then they have lines, and one line's longer than the other line. And all the other 11 people say the shorter line is longer. Mm -hmm. And like nine out of 10 people, after they get it, just start going along with them. But the one in 10 person who doesn't go along with them, they have a meltdown. They go, God, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, I don't know why I'm seeing something different than everybody else. But that one looks shorter than me. And there was nobody in the experiment who would be like me. I would just say, oh, that one's shorter. And the fact that 11 other people had just said it was longer I wouldn't care. I would just say it. I wouldn't apologize. I wouldn't call them crazy or stupid. I just say, 
So would you admit that you were wrong if someone was able to show you some, from some different angle and you wound up being wrong? Would you say, oh, OK, all right, you got me. But the purpose of the Solomon Ash experiment was. There's nothing in the world that can make a shorter, you know, it was just like two lines drawn on a blackboard. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But yeah, some, so, uh, some, some might say that the quality of not wanting to die a social death, not wanting to preserve yourself. That's that's while it's noble. Some people might say, well, that's like an antisocial quality. Why aren't you getting there? Aren't there something wrong with you? Why aren't you getting nervous about or to second I guess talk about somebody who would say that about me? What would Ethan Adelman say about the fact? How does Ethan Adelman deal with things like that? And how would he view me dealing with them? How does Ethan Adelman think about the fact that I'll go against everybody else. Yeah, he's, he wants you to relax. It's something to the effect of, why don't you just relax, man? Those are 11 good people. So what if they see a shorter, you know? So what if they got the lines wrong? Just, you know, sit back and smoke what a cigarette. to kill you? you know, yeah, right, right. You learn a stupid experiment, you know? What really counts? You know, maybe you're going to try and get them to join your organization. <laughs> right. Who cares? Um, so... Here's, here's an example where that happened in public. Um, OSF, the, uh, the Open Societies Foundation, uh, presented Carl Hart's speech on the myths of amphetamines. It was in 2014, I believe. And on the panel was Holly Catania, one of the people, she's a lawyer, and she worked with uh, Gary Belkin. And she got up and she presented, I, I, maybe you've seen the before and after picture of people on amphetamines. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And then they're good looking and then they're wrecks. And her point was, they publicized these pictures of people being wrecks they didn't have a right to do that. But Carl actually talks about that. And he said, people don't become wrecks because they take amphetamines, drug, because kids take uh, the equivalent drugs and they don't become wrecks. It's a matter of a whole lifestyle that's involved. And so I'm sitting in the audience thinking, Carl Hart is making a speech about um, myths of amphetamines she's presenting a myth of amphetamines it's yeah. a, it was packed and it was run by kasha malinowska carl was there a good friend of mine was on the panel uh you know a, a man named howard a great great man howard josepher not one person said anything how could that be? And we're there to talk about um, the purpose was to dispute um, myths about methamphetamines. So why, why is that? Why would nobody do that? Why would nobody actually uh, make a comment about that? I think we've gone over the explanation. Everybody was on board. They're all in the boat. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Why rock the boat? Everybody's happy. Um, I mean, I don't think, I don't even know that the whole thing would enter Kasia Malinowski's mind. And we could, why would Carl, who's commented on that specific thing, not say anything? And why couldn't I be satisfied to let that go by? Why would I uh, insist on it? Um, so as a rule of thumb, audiences are not trained and people to think actively, but to accept. Um, and so after Carl had done this remarkable thing at the very beginning of the presentation in a packed audience. He had said, I just want to say something 
Stanton Peel is in the audience. Got to give Carl credit. And he says, you know, nearly everything I say, Stanton has been saying for decades. You know, God bless the man. And so after his presentation, God, I had gumption. I got up. I wasn't an invited speaker. And I said, Carl's been talking about myths. I want to give you a list of five myths. I had five facts about drugs. And I want you to react to each one of them of whether they're true or false. Do most people who take narcotics become addicted? Do most people become addicted to narcotics or other things overcome them without treatment? And I went through five myths and a majority of people voted for the myth in all of those. And I said, you're wrong. You're here at a presentation about myths and you're endorsing and accepting myths um, in this very process. How can that be? So I just want to give one, um, what would Ethan say? And I, I, I have a quote from Ethan because uh, what Ethan says to me is, Stan, you know what Ronald Reagan said? Two people have told me this. I think it's so amusing. Those two people are Johan Hari and Ethan Edelman. <laughs> Ronald Reagan says, if somebody, I'll do Ethan. If somebody agrees with you 90% of the time and they're on your side, you ignore those things you disagree about. Uh, don't even bother with them because they're on your team and you're trying to go somewhere with them. That's what Ethan would say. And I'm going to contrast that with what, uh, on my 60th birthday, Archie gave a speech about me. And this is part of what he said. Stanton is one of the world's great iconoclasts, contrarians, and rascals. He provokes people often for a serious purpose and sometimes, well, just for the fun of it. For Stanton, the meaning of addiction lies in what really motivates people as opposed to what they think motivates them. The comforting illusions they use to cushion themselves from reality. Stanton's great gift, both innate and cultivated, is to look straight at the truth with as few as possible psychological and cultural blinders. Nothing can deter Stanton's seriousness of purpose and his willingness when necessary to stand alone. So, in a way, that's the theme of, I mean, Archie said that on my 60th birthday. I published my memoir, A Scientific Life on the Edge, My Lonely Quest to Change How We See Addiction on my 75th birthday or thereafter. Um, but in that little quote, Archie describes the essential conflict at the core of my mission on earth, which is for various reasons, more or less, people accept a ton of myths around drugs and alcohol. And even the leading drug policy reformers are as much in that kettle of fish as some of the biggest blowhards and fakers. And I won't let an inch go by without calling a timeout against that and saying, you're wrong. What you're saying is not true. You could say, you could say different things about you and Ethan. You know, his way of doing things is, well, like you say, ignore the 10% of things you don't agree about and form a coalition. Um, about the 90% of things you do, you can make a lot of change. You're, say, you're there at places not to waste your time, but to build on things that are true and hopefully make some progress. Um, of course, whatever, 
whether you're doing that or not is that could be up for debate, I guess. You could argue that um, by you're putting people in a state of dissonance, which really makes them double down. And so the what there they walk out with is that Peel guy was a jerk and they don't really think about, you know, some of the things that he wanted them to think about. It doesn't get to what's true, but at least you're doing the more noble act of identifying the elephant in the room so that people have a chance to think about it. And I, I do appreciate that value. And what people would have to say about me, I think, is, well, Stanton tells things the way he sees them. Mm-hmm. It's sort of, uh, I mentioned in another presentation, my old friend, Ann, uh, old Dan Morris, I would say, well, who are you trying to act like or how are you trying to present yourself? And she would say, I'm trying to present myself as myself. Mm-hmm. You know that I'm never, ever, ever going to say anything that I don't believe is true. But at a deeper level, and this is caused quite a conflict with Ethan Nadelman, the essential thing that's wrong with American policy that impacts both the straight-laced medical establishment and the drug reform movement is thinking of addiction in terms of being a drug-based disease. Mm. There's no way you can short shuffle that. And my relationship breaking claim with Ethan is that he tried to do that. He would say, well, I'm not gonna go against AA while I'm trying to legalize marijuana. And his hope was, well, the marijuana haters would get on board, they never did. The disease people never really, um, like, you know, Ted Kennedy's son, they'll never really get on board with Ethan's larger program. It was a, it's a fool's errand. And what I'm saying is, if you don't confront the fundamentals of the phenomenon of what addiction is, you'll go off into tangents like believing that we can cure addiction with medications, as in medicine for opioid use disorders. And that's a f- kind of a modish, woke way of taking the disease theory and repackaging it. Yeah, and you'll never so- win that way. I would never go against AA while I'm trying to legalize marijuana. I would never... Um, I would never make a correction to an erroneous conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit while I'm trying to, you know, put, bring out diversity. I would never, I mean, you can list it, but you're not that. You're a referee for objectivity in a way. You could do it in more or less harsh ways. Sometimes you do it with compassion and you have some room for that and you want to engage people. Sometimes not. Sometimes you thrive in the situation where, oh, look, another another time where everybody's asleep and maybe I'll wake somebody up. But, you know, you when you put it that way, you create the list of all the things we ignore and the consequences of ignoring them. You're on the right well, side. I guess that's why we're, uh, that's a good summary of things you wouldn't do. I, I wouldn't ever go as far as Ethan Nadelman. I mean, I'm interested in, I know you're trying to wrap it up, but just to clarify, I'm interested in, um, I'm more apt to help people think about their basis for believing something, just to, you know, kind of interrogate their own belief system in a way that they can handle it. They can stay on board and not fall off during the conversation. That's the only difference between me and you who doesn't well, mind you give. calling a spade a spade. You're, you never are trying to, sh- when t- you're trying to tell people the truth, you're not going, nah, nah, you're wrong. You're not trying to show them up. You're trying to encourage and help them. You're a helper. I mean, and you, thank God you work with kids. You know what I mean? I'm glad you're a helper. Um, you're in the right, you know, you got in the right line of work, although helping people with addictive problems is the same way. And it's... um. It's a fabulous gift you have. It really is. But just to put a, when I said I would never, I think about AA, I would never Celsius to Fahrenheit. I'm I'm being Ethan in that situation. I'm listing the things Ethan maybe wouldn't do. That if you put that list, how would you would you have said anything about centigrade Fahrenheit? 
Absolutely. Yep, I would have. How would you have done it? How would you have, um, other than raising your hand and saying, can I say this in English, you know, which is already, you're in French class. That's what. Well, I like to, I like to come back with a story after those situations and pretend I was really bold, but probably what I, if I'm honest, what I would do is I would ask about the fundamentals. Now, how did you get that answer? Um, isn't it true that this, uh, you know, whatever would go into the equation, are you sure that's right? Can we look at it for a second? Can we step it, you know, a softer way, but I, there's no chance I could ignore something glaring like that. So I, like you, I, I don't, I can't let things like that go. Well, I'm sorry that I accused you of being, that. <laughs> um, but I do want to emphasize your gift for facilitation and, um, you know, you quoted your daughter after she saw um, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And she said, I would be his friend and then he wouldn't be so mean. <laughs> and there was most kids probably watch the beginning of that show and they say, oh, we should smash that guy down. You know what? I mean, he's bad. Um, <laughs> She's interested in what makes the bad guy tick. Yeah. And you're like, maybe we can un wine this thing and in my best moments i think you gave me credit i can do that too sure. but when you're in front the room osf was packed with like 500 people <laughs> and they're all going along with the presentation of myth what can i tell you i just couldn't contain myself <laughs> maybe i'll become a better person <laughs> so anyhow the uh, title of this piece is what the hell's the matter with you, Peel? At least we've plumbed that depth. <laughs> Thank you, Stanton. It's always good to know. It's an endearing quality for, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks for uh, feeling that way, Zach, and for partnering with me. Au revoir.